Hi everyone, Vacha here from Recording Studio 9 and thanks for joining me. I'll assume you're watching this video because either you are interested in purchasing the Behringer UFX 1604 mixer and audio interface and you want to know a little bit more about it, or you already own one and you want to find out a little bit more details of its operation. This is part one of multi-part series videos that I'll be producing on Behringer's UFX1604, which also applies the 1204 the smaller version of its big brother. In this part one, I'll be talking about channels one and two, all of its buttons, knobs and functions, and how it actually operates. So let's have a look at Behringer's UFX 1604 channel 1 and 2, which are located the far left two channels. The reason I chose channel 1 and 2 because they have an extra option compared to the microphone inputs 3 to 8. From the top, we can see we have the XLR input for the microphone level audio signals. This is where we plug our lead for our microphones. Below that, we have the TRS balanced input for line level, as well as instrument level audio signal. Here is the difference between channel 1 and 2 and the rest of the microphone inputs. It's that it can also accept instrument input, being electric guitars, bass guitars, or any guitars with a pickup, active or passive pickups. The green button that below that enables us to select whether that the line level input is line or high impedance guitar input. It's really great because this allows us to plug the guitars directly in to the mixer without using any DI boxes. A quick note, even though plugging in a microphone and a line level like a synthesizer or drum machine or your guitar at the same time, it will work, but it will be combined. So you won't be able to adjust individual levels. Below that, we have the orange button, which is the low cut switch. This cuts any frequency below 80 Hz, having an 18 dB slope. So any rumbles or low frequency signals will be cut out. Next to that is the 48 volt phantom power button. And this is individual for each channel, which is really great. Allows you to individually select the phantom power for microphones like condenser microphones who do require phantom power. And below that, is our input gain knob. This provides from plus 10 dB to plus 60 dB of gain for the microphone XLR input and minus 10 dB to plus 40 dB gain for the TRS input. So that if our line level input is too loud, we can actually turn it down minus 10 dB. And this is the most important knob in your mixer channel. This gain knob allows you to set the incoming audio signal's gain level for gain staging, as well as the output level for your USB Firewire analog to digital conversion stage, as well as onboard recording levels. The next option on the channel strip is the send pre and post option. Having the button up position, it means in a pre compression and EQ stage, being sent to your USB or Firewire connection to the PC or for the onboard recording. Pressing down the send button as post, that means the audio signal is routed through the compressor and the EQ section before it is sent out to the USB Firewire interface as well as printed on the onboard multi-track recording. Now one of the reasons that you might want the send option pre or post is that a lot of the times when you are recording a live band, the if EQ settings that and the compression settings that you might have will suit for the environment. And you certainly don't want that printed either when you're recording on board multi-track or you're sending it to your PC. You want that to be pre so that you get dry signal into your DAW so you can EQ and compress it later on in post-processing. But if you are recording in the studio and you like the EQ settings that you have had already uh, for whatever instrument or vocalist that you are recording, you can certainly press the um, post option for the send and that way you can print 
all of the EQ and the compression settings that you had for that recording session. Each channel comes with one knob compressor, which is quite common in many of the Behringer's mixers. This dynamically compresses the incoming audio and also applies auto gain. Next to it, there is a red LED indicates when the compressor is engaged. You can adjust your compressor knob until you get, you know, intermittent LED flashes when the signal gets loud. Use this also option sparingly. Below that is our EQ section, and it starts with the high shelf EQ at uh, 12 kilohertz, and this gives you 15 dB gain and reduction from 12 kilohertz. You can use this EQ to give some air and clarity, if needed, to the incoming audio. But uh, be careful, because too much high-end will actually sound very brittle and unpleasant to the ear. You can also use this to reduce any cymbal harshness as well. Below that is the mid-high parametric EQ knobs that provide a sweeping frequency from 400Hz to 8kHz and with a gain and reduction of plus or minus 15 dB. One of the knobs selects the frequency, while the other reduces or gives it gain. Below that, we have the low-mid parametric EQ knobs, very similar, with a frequency range from 100 Hz to 2 kHz. Again, plus or minus 15 dB gain or reduction. It's a great way to use the parametric EQs to reduce muddiness or hole feedback during live performance. The way you can actually sweep and find out a problematic feedback frequencies is to turn your gain all the way up and then move the frequency or sweep it until the feedback really howls. Then you can use the gain to reduce that frequency, thus minimizing any microphone feedback. Again, use sparingly because it's not a narrow cue, it is a wide cue, so you don't want to cut out too much of the frequencies. Now, here's something interesting. Since the low, mid and the high, mid frequency points cross each other, interesting effects can be achieved. Like you could try to increase the gain with one set at 1 kilohertz while reducing it with the other set and observing it. And lastly, we have the low shelf EQ, which starts shelving at 80 hertz. Again, plus or minus 15 dB. Great way to increase the energy for kick drums or bass guitars, or you can actually remove low frequency unwanted energy from other instruments. And finally, the blue EQ on button. This allows you to engage or bypass the complete EQ section. This way you can AB the, any EQ changes you've done to see if the changes made the audio sound any better or not. Also, if you do require to use the send as post-production, but we don't want to use the EQ section, you can bypass the EQ to make sure that no EQ is sent to the USB via wire to the PC, or print it on the onboard recorder, but still use the compression. Next comes the auxiliary send options. There are four auxiliary send knobs, auxiliary one to four. Auxiliary signals are subgroups of the mixer that route the audio into different sockets at the back of the unit for various external processing or use. There are two main auxiliary send knobs for each channel. Auxiliary signals can be set to pre or post fader, meaning audio can be sent even if the channel fader or the master fader is set to off. And we will look at this in future video. Auxiliary 3 and or FXA sends the signal to the built-in FXA module. But at the same time, plugging in a lead into the auxiliary 3 output socket, this engages the built-in FXA module. So it will act like any of the auxiliary one or two. And auxiliary four or FXB allows you to send the audio signal from the channel into FXB module. Again, plugging in any TRS lead into the auxiliary four output socket, this engages the built-in FXB module. As you can see here, these are the four auxiliary send output sockets at the back of the unit. Now, if you are mixing a live session and you are recording at the same time, you may require more than two auxiliary monitors on, on the stage. So you can use the auxiliary three and four, bypass the effects modules, and have up to four individual set of 
monitoring system for the musicians to hear themselves and then you can use external effects to fit in into your mix. Well up to this point for channels 1 and 2 the incoming audio signal is mono and the panning knob allows us now to hand the incoming audio to left or right, center or anything in between. So we can place the incoming audio signal in our stereo imaginary stage. Up next is the mute button. This basically mutes the channel so that the audio no longer reaches the main bus. It's very handy if you have unused microphones on the stage to minimize any additional noise or feedback. But at the same time, pressing the mute button, the audio is sent to the alternative outputs 3 and 4. It's quite handy to use the alternative outputs 3 and 4 to hook up speakers in your control room. That way, whenever you are muting all of the channels from the front of house speakers, you can listen to them in your control room while the band is rehearsing or preparing. The solo button simply solos that channel, which is the reverse of the mute. That means all the other channels get muted except the one soloed. This is a good, great way to actually check if each and individual channel is all working. But there are two modes for the solo button in this mixer, which we will cover this topic at a later video. There is the normal mode, which is as I explained, and there's also the PFL or pre-fader level mode, which basically pressing the solo button in a pre-fader mode allows you to use detailed VU meter on the main bus as your level meter for that channel only. As I mentioned, I will cover this topic in a later video. Next we have the fader which adjusts the volume level of the audio channel from infinity into off all the way down to all the way up to plus 10 dB and having 0 dB as the unity level. And as a tip, after setting your channel gain using the PFL and the gain knob, which I showed you before, you can adjust the fader volume for a well-balanced mix. A lot of people get confused between the gain knob and the fader. I will talk about gain staging and the difference between the gain knob and the fader knob in a later video as well. And finally, we have the four-stage level LED VU meter, which gives you a rough idea of the incoming audio. And you should actually have the signal coming anywhere between minus 24 and minus 12 dB. And sometimes at 0 dB is fine. But if you are getting the red clip LED light up, that means your gain knob is too loud. So you need to turn your gain knob down. Well, that's end of part one, all about channel one and two. In the next video, I'll be talking about channels three to eight as well as 9 to 16 and what the differences are and what different options those channels have. Well, till next time, as always, thanks for watching and have a great time making music. Cheerio, guys.